I'll bring the uh, Bible reading to us this morning, which comes from Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, starting at verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them, that is, Silas and Timothy, in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. And some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, well, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if needing anything. Rather, he himself gives everything life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Well, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. And some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just want to say thank you for the way in which you have brought us to this point, to hear this word. As we read in that text, you are determining the movements of peoples so that they would reach out for you and find, find you. So we pray, Lord, for, for us who have found you, that we will keep on repenting. And for those who haven't, that, that we will indeed turn and trust you for the first time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Well, two weeks on holiday, you're reminded about how different you and your spouse are. And um, dear old Sandy and I, by goodness, we're really different. Uh, we're different in personality. Would you believe it? I'm the introvert. She's the extrovert. I think out loud. She thinks in her head. She's organised. I'm trying to be. You know, so we've got all those differences. <laughs> And then, of course, there's the cultural differences, and you may have heard me talk about you. I'm from a Maltese background. She's Aussie. Uh, I'm working class, peasant, so uh, we talk fast, loud, eat, eat, eat fast, talk loud, hands on the table. She, she comes from a home where they're quieter, um, things are sort of hidden more, um, there's a more gentle manner, and they eat slowly. Apparently, they eat with their mouth closed, which is a new idea. <laughs> And she, and, um, but I always remember the time she, she, she used to get headaches coming when we were engaged, seeing the family. I said, how come you've got a headache? She said, I think it's an anticipation of what I'm about to have, Ray. With your family gatherings are so noisy. And uh, she said, one day, your parents divorcing. I said, they're not divorcing. Why would you think that? She said, well, they, they argue all the time. They're fighting all the time. I said, Sandy, that's not fighting. That's talking. <laughs> As life goes on, you learn. I, I learned to, that I, to, to, to love Sandy, I had to turn down the volume. Now, there you would say the harmless cultural differences that you've got to work through, right? But at the end of the day, lodged with every culture, every family, there are ideas, belief systems that are fundamentally anti-Christian. Uh, and not the least is that every culture, every family, heck, every person thinks they're right. Uh, and we've got this kind of blind spot on ourselves, you know, like the blind spot when you're driving. Kind of like an accent, you can't hear your own accent, so everyone's got an accent except you. Kind of like bad breath, you know, you're the last person to know, you need other people to tell you. And cultures, uh, uh, the thing about cultures is, like families, they're about loyalty. You're either for us or you're against us. And you know it, especially when a, someone becomes a Christian in a non-Christian family or a non-Christian culture the way in which it turns everything upside down and generates so much hostility. Now, the Apostle Paul in this passage is on his second missionary journey. He's on the back end of it. Uh, this is not your Kentucky tour in the Greek islands, right? He's there to do a job, and that is to proclaim the good news of Jesus. He's waiting for his co-workers to come, and while he's waiting for them, and they're days away, he walks around this city of Athens with this great history. And um, now he's not just curious. In verse 16, we're told that when he sees this, what one person called a forest of idols, I mean, there were statues and gods to everyone. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was, what was he? Greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Oh, that we would be jealous for God to know that of the, what, nearly 25 million Australians, so few of them thank him and love him on his terms through Jesus Christ. There's your basis for evangelism. This is where this sermon comes from, you know. He's upset at the way in which the God of the universe has been reduced to a deaf, dumb and blind idol, lifeless idol. He knows that God will not share his glory with another. And, and you can tell he's so upset that this sermon flows out of not just his concern for the Athenians, but his concern for God. Now, before long, he starts a conversation and then they hear what he's saying. So they invite him to what's called the Areopagus. It's kind of like infotainment at its worst. And these uh, two schools of philosophers, Epicureans and Stoics, uh, Luke's having a bit of go at them. You know, they didn't so much love the truth, they loved new ideas. You know, they just love yapping away. Um, now, at one level, think about what's taking place here. Paul is a Jew who worships the God and Father of, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking to people from other cultures who worship other gods. Wow, that's like our world, isn't it? Multi-faith, multicultural, pluralistic. Now notice how Paul speaks. Firstly, you've got to tell you, he's very respectful. Um, he talks about how they're religious. He doesn't point the finger. He said, you should not think, but he said, we should not think. You know, the... God is an image. He starts with where they're at. Uh, they had a God for everything, right? But just in case they missed something, they, you know, they had their each way bet and, and it was the altar to an unknown God. And he uses that to spring off this magnificent sermon. And he, what he does is he tries, he wants to tell them about the God they don't know, that they may know him. And what he does is he draws a circle around everyone. And he's very inclusive. So at the end of the day, he can preach to them the exclusive claim that Jesus needs to be Lord of all people and all cultures. So what does everyone have in common? Point one, 
one, there's one creator. In Acts 17, verse 24, we read, The God who made the heaven, sorry, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So you can see what Paul is doing. He's positioning the creator of the unit, one one God, not many, as the creator of all people, everything and, and everything in it, so that everyone is connected by the one creator who sustains it. Now that's interesting. Those Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, they thought the world came about through chance. Paul's saying, actually, no, this wasn't a fluke. A bit like modern Australians think the world came about through a series of accidents. He's saying there's a personal God who stands over every person because God created every person. Uh, Every race has this in common. They've all been made by the one God. It's what binds us together. And and along the way, he says, we don't create space for God, like building temples. He created space for us by creating the earth. That we don't make him in our image or make images of him. Rather, we ourselves have been made in his image. Of all the things that have been allowed to uh, reflect God, only we are allowed to be his image. Why? Because we're thinking, feeling, speaking beings. Anything less than that dishonours God. And we're all equally dependent on him. Um, Whether you're the President of the United States or some pauper in Bangladesh, we all live and move and have our being in God. In fact, that quote is taken from a prayer to Zeus. It's one of those times you see Paul engaging with other religions, taking a truth from there and saying, you know that bit? That's actually true. That lines up with the Bible. And he's trying to show in the end how the kind of the Greek gods were spiritually bankrupt. You know, um, they needed to be carried, not them carrying us. Uh, they, uh, idolatry just always places humans... Uh, Sorry, the gods at the mercy of humans. But humans are at the mercy of God. He does not need anything from us. That's why I I always loved Scott uh, when he wrote that song, Independent God, because it just stood out. It's even against other hymns that may sometimes get the feeling that God is almost dependent on us. But God is the independent God. He has no needs that need to be... He does not need us. That's a good place to start. One God who created the world, we're made in his image. We are not to make images of him. Point two, one ancestor. We all come from the one man. Look at verse 26. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So Adam believed in historic Adam. It's not a myth. You've all, and, and that Romans 5 says the same thing. We all come from the one man. You see, we're all related by blood. Cousins. <laughs> I'm looking at my cousins. Now, I've got 100 first cousins, but really, I've got as many Christian cousins as, as there are Christians. Cousins. We're all related by virtue of the fact that we all go back, we were created through Adam. Or rather, we, we descended from Adam. Now, of course, we're only brother and sister by virtue of the fact that God is our father through the death of Jesus. So you go from cousins to brother and sister only through Christ. So Adam is the granddaddy of the Aborigines as much as he is of the Turk. Uh, we had a proud Assyrian at MBM who will remain nameless. Uh, did his, you know, he thought he was a thoroughbred, you know, pure Assyrian. And he did a DNA test. He was so disappointed. He was only 35% Middle Eastern. <laughs> I think it was 17% Mediterranean. I said, count your blessings, bro. Uh, (laughs) Because we're all trying to define ourselves ethnically. Forget it. We've been defined by the fact that we come from the one man. Um, And whatever separates us, uh, we have one God who made us all from, we're all children, descendants of Adam. And by the way, that's what makes, um, that's what makes racism wrong and stupid. Uh, and we need to grasp this. Race, now, there is a thing called institutional racism, and when, and when you're the dominant culture, you don't see it, and so minorities are experiencing it all the time. But let's face it, racism lurks in every one of our hearts to a greater or lesser extent. 
Um, and, and pretending it's not there, I just think means you're only having yourself on. It's not a white man's problem, though. We wanted to say that. Uh, one brother from church who's Vietnamese talked about how his cousins were paying out on Pauline Hansen because Pauline Hansen was, that was sort of phase one of Pauline Hansen when she was bagging out too many Asians in Australia. And uh, so his Vietnamese cousins were bagging out Pauline Hansen, okay, but and then they bagged out their niece for going out with a Cambodian. And he said, well, you're just as racist. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> The issue is always, will I treat the person in front of me and think the best rather than importing whatever prejudices I have? Remember prejudice? To prejudge someone, it is a cruel thing. Point three, one experience of providence. God is in charge of the rise, spread and fall of every culture and people. Verse 26, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So it was God who determined when the Athenian culture would flourish. It was God who decided when the Russian Revolution would begin and when the Berlin Wall would be brought down. And no one saw that one coming. God is the reason why one out of every four babies born are Chinese. You just never know what you're going to get. It was God who decided who and how many migrants would come to this country. Um, Think God's thoughts about migration rather than whatever redneck uh, uh, radio announcer you're listening to. That would be my recommendation. God was behind you, your father, your great-great-grandfather in coming to this country, whether it was 40,000 years ago in a canoe or you're fresh off the boat and you came here yesterday. Um, And point four, for one reason God does this, so that we would reach out for him. Point four, to reach out for him. Look at verse 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. God's hand is involved. This is not to say that when cultures destroy other cultures, it's right or anything. So, you know, we're not denying the sinfulness of how these things happen. But God is saying, I'm working in all things with a greater plan. And I can even use the sins of one nation against another for my ultimate purposes, even though I am angry at the sin of a nation who harms another nation. But what he's saying is God's hand is involved in every aspect of a culture's life for one purpose, so that people would reach out for him and be saved. That's an amazing concept, that all of history is about salvation. The shifts and movements of people groups. And the last 50 to 100 years has never seen more people move uh, than any other time. God is determining the where and when of people and family groups and tribes with this one stubborn goal that they would, almost like groping in the dark, reach out for God and be saved. Now, I don't exactly know how it all works out in detail, Though I do know, and I've seen it quite a number of times, that when God humbles a people uh, through sad, tragic circumstances, that they're so often more likely to accept Christ. You know, a, a, a recent refugee is more likely to be won over for Jesus than a fifth-generation fifth established person in Australia. It's just the dislocation makes them more open. There's an Islamic tribe in Iraq that has been really devastated under ISIS. They are seeing many of them come to Christ through the work of Samaritan Purse and in a way that they've never been open to Jesus. Now, that's not to justify ISIS. It's an evil regime. But God is using it to bring people to himself. Now, let's remind ourselves of the history of migration in Australia as we think about this purpose. Um, Well, of course, there's the original custodians, our indigenous cousins, uh, uh, and uh, they've arrived somewhere between the 14th, uh, sorry, 40 to 50 years ago, something even longer. Then on the 18th and 19th century, we had large-scale British migration. Then 1851, the discovery of gold that brought Europeans, North Americans and Chinese. From 1940 to 1960, we had three million uh, uh, migrate from Europe. Two of them were my parents. Uh, Then the white Australian policy, my goodness, we had a white Australian policy. The white Australian policy was finally removed in 72 by Whitlam. And during the 70s and 80s, 120,000 Asian uh, Asian refugees migrated. Now, really, the story of migration follows events that have happened in the world. So the fall of Saigon and the end of the Vietnam War in 75 brought in a whole lot of Indo-Chinese. Some of you are here today. 
Uh, uh, East Timor and uh, the fall of Dili to the Indonesian troops meant a whole number of Timorese found homes here in Australia. The Lebanese Civil War, and again, some of you who are here today, in 75, 20,000 Muslim refugees came as a result of that civil war. Then you've got the dictatorships in South America, in Chile, Argentina and Uruguay, seeking asylum in the 70s and 80s. Then the Tiananmen Square massacre, uh, when Bob Hawke allowed Chinese students to stay in Australia. Uh, because of the hostility of the, of the Chinese government at the time. Then you've got the Yugoslav walls in the Balkans. 91 right through 2001 drove Albanians, Bosnians, Croats and Serbs to settle in Australia. In fact, the person who, did a, who fixed up our fence was a Croatian, Sasha, who basically, who I think he or his family came from that. More recently, we've got Sudanese who are in our church came as a result of the Sudanese Civil War, and then we've got the Syrian crisis. And I don't know if you know, but we actually host a ministry that provides food for Syrian refugees every Wednesday. God has brought the nations to this country with one single purpose, so that they would reach out for him and find him. Just on the screen now, we've got um, an exp a, a part of our extended mission statement. And it reads this, and this is a very important, this passage is very precious in the history of MBM. God, in his sovereign control of history, has brought the nations into our backyard. We refuse to let this wonderful opportunity slip through our hands. God desires all people to be saved, and so do we. That is what MBM is about. And you know what the icing on the cake is? Is that half of our missionaries have gone back, nearly half, to their country of origin. So Mark Borg, born and grew up in Malta, is now back in Malta preaching the gospel. Jeff Kushkiri, whose father was from Malta, is back in Malta. LJ is back in, is Filipina, back in the Philippines. See, why do you think you're living in Australia? For a better life? No, for eternal life. <laughs> And we do have a right to speak to every culture about Jesus. Refuse to be intimidated, brothers and sisters. And I'll tell you why, because we'll all stand before the one judge. Point five, one judge. In Acts 17, verse 31, we read, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, that's Jesus. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. God has appointed one man to judge the nations. There are no cultural favourites, eh? Everyone has to give an account to this one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. No one gets in because they've told themselves, well, I'm all right because I'm Anglican, I'm Catholic, I'm, I'm Buddhist, I'm, 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 I'm Muslim. Whatever conversation you're having in your head that makes you think you're all right, you're not all right. Every human on this earth will have to give an account of their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that God hasn't already unloaded judgment is the sheer mercy of God, given the way we've treated him. And he has look, overlooked our rebellion so far, but look at verse 30, 30. In the meantime, he's issued a command. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. He's been very patient with humans. But now, in light of the arrival of Jesus Christ, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And that's point six. One command to repent. Everyone is issued this command that has ever walked the face of this earth for the last 2,000 years. Now by repentance, we mean turning from idols to the true and living God. By repentance, we're not talking about remorse. We've all felt sorry for things we never stopped doing. By repentance, we don't mean reform. A lot of people, a lot of addicts have said no to the bottle, uh, to alcohol, but not yes to Jesus. Repentance is about turning from my sins, which includes idolatry, and turning to Jesus Christ. It's about turning from a life run by me to turning to a life run by Jesus. Repentance is how I like to put it, making Jesus the main character of your life. And the plea, I was brought up this way, it's not going to hold, hold weight. Not in light of today's message anyway. It won't stand on the day of judgment. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that you or anyone else is a victim of their culture. <laughs> I'll say it again. Do not fall into the trap of thinking you or anyone else is a victim of your culture. That command has been issued by God himself who commands everyone. And when he says everyone, he means everyone, all people. 
all nations, all ages, all styles, personalities, sexual orientations, all religions, all styles. You're not at the mercy of your upbringing. Culture, families, individuals must bow before Christ. And what we need to get clear in our heads, and the reason why we can say that, is point seven, there's one proof for all people. There is sufficient proof for all people. There is evidence that has been given for you to repent if you haven't already. Verse 31. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So as far as God is concerned, the resurrection of the dead, sorry, the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day, and he includes in that the, the ten eyewitness accounts of Jesus' post-resurrected body when Jesus appeared on at least ten other occasions during a 40-day period before he ascended into heaven. That event and the subsequent appearances are deemed sufficient evidence for every human being that you meet, including yourself, as being sufficient evidence for you to turn your life from sin to, to, us, to your saviour. Bertram Russell, the atheist philosopher in England last century, said, uh, was asked one day, because he didn't believe in God, he said, uh, Bernard, what would you say to God on Judgment Day if Christianity is right? And he said, well, I'll tell Jesus you didn't give me enough evidence. <laughs> well, he can say they're all right, but it's not going to win the case. There's only, one, there's only one opinion that counts. It's Jesus. He's the judge, and he issues the criteria for judgment. I have given you enough evidence, but you were too proud to accept it. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is deemed sufficient reason for every person to leave this building today on the right side of Jesus. And, and it doesn't matter who, whether you're talking to a, a Kenyan grandmother or a left-wing, lentil-eating, LSD-taking, one-legged Buddhist prostitute. I don't know, I'm just trying to come up with it. Come up with it. God commands everybody to repent. No one is born a Christian. God has no grandchildren. Every generation must repent. Our kids need to repent. You need to I need to repent. Now, the result of that talk, you notice that sermon? Some believed, others laughed. So you don't have the 3,000 bowed the knee as in Pentecost. Because remember in Pentecost, in Acts 2, that was the result of Jesus, the 12 and the 72, doing three years of heavy evangelism. It was really the fruit of that. But it shows you the power of the gospel. Just on hearing that message once was enough for a couple of people to say yes to Christ. But which is it for you? Will you be a follower of Jesus and turn and repent? Or will you laugh in the face of this evidence yet again? The tendency today is to focus on the differences. And in, and in one sense, I love celebrating the diversity of cultures, especially the food. It's fantastic. But God tells us that when it, when it, where it matters, we're exactly the same. One God who created us, we've come from the one man, we'll stand before the one judge who's issued the one command to repent and he's given us sufficient evidence by raising his son from the dead. And the reason why you know it's a word for you is that Paul is speaking to Athenians and he is telling them and everyone that we're all in the same boat. They might have lived on the other side of the microphone and the microchip, <laughs> But on all the key matters, we're exactly the same. And we've all been issued the one command. There is no us and them. In fact, the only dividing line here is not race, gender, or anything else. Personality, it is simply this. Have you or have you not repented? Now, now listen to it. Listen to that sentence again. Who is issuing the command? God. Not Paul. Not me. Not the church. God commands. And notice, it's a command. It's not a suggestion or a thought or a possibility. God commands. Who does he command? Everyone. That means he commands you and the person next to you and in front of you. And what does he command? To repent. To turn from your sins. And you know you need to turn because they weren't doing you any good anyway. And to trust in the Lord Jesus who's come to give you life and to show you where salvation is truly found. Now, I think for many of us who have repented, that's the big R repentance. 
Well, what we've got to keep on doing is the little R repentance day by day where Jesus says, anyone who would come after him must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. If there's a corner in your life that you still have not allowed Jesus to have lordship in, hear the call. God commands you to repent. And for those of you who are here today and you've not accepted Christ, then why don't you pray this prayer? In fact, we can all pray this prayer. Some of us are praying the big R repentance where we're going to turn for the very first time. For many of us, it's the little R. But I just want to give you time to think, where is it that you need to repent and let Jesus be Lord? Let's pause for a moment before I actually lead us in a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, whatever differences there are between us, and there are many, you have made us all. You are sustaining us all. You have been so patient for so long with all of us. Thank you for bringing us to this country, this city, and to this this 9am service so that we may seek you, find you. We truly believe, Lord God, that you raised Jesus from the dead. And so, Lord, for some of us, for the very first time, we surrender to you, Lord Jesus, as our Lord and as our Saviour. And Father, for, other, for most of us, Father, there are areas of our life that are still out of line with you. We don't want that to be the case. You don't want that to be the case. And so we ask, Heavenly Father, help us to bring alignment. Help us to know that true freedom is found in you. Help us to surrender that part of our life that is out of line, that we may delight in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.